and I fall within a structure. I fall within the structure of nine airports in the country, and we report into a center of excellence, which is um, otherwise known as our head office. Uh, my background, I have an MBA in business administration. I um, was a policeman for 15 years. I worked in operations thereafter for another period of eight years, and I joined the airport in 2011. So that's a bit of background for me. Um, can we go to the next slide? I think the slide would be background. Can someone just uh, cue me? Right, can you see there? Uh, no, I can't see any of the presentation, so I have a, a, um, a hard right, copy with content. me. Content, so you're on so, content there. All right, in terms of content, colleagues, I'm just going to take you through a bit of a background, uh, pre-COVID conditions in South Africa, the impact on aviation security, the impact on uh, aviation itself, uh, the changing role of security, and a quick conclusion. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you, the background. Right, you there, 5th of March, 2020. Thank you very much. On the 5th of March, uh, colleagues, 2020, uh, we had the first positive case of COVID in South Africa. Uh, on the 23rd of March, a national lockdown was announced for the 27th of March. And obviously, as you're well aware, several uh, closures to the various business sectors were effected. We had several lockdown levels from five all the way to one, which we are currently on. And we had increasing, we had increasing infection numbers uh, as much as 20,000 recently, uh, more than 20,000 recently per day. Uh, these numbers were extremely high. And obviously the president then, you know, we really looked at uh, the, the legislation around COVID-19 and imposed further conditions over the last couple of weeks. Um, in February 2021, South Africa was the highest confirmed number, has, was, has the highest confirmed number of COVID-19 cases in Africa and also ranks 15 in the world. Uh, luckily for us, in terms of the percentage uh, related to mortality, we have a relatively low mortality rate in the country. Um, you know, there's various reasons why that is, but um, obviously it is a good thing for us. Next slide, please. Right, general information. Thank you. Pre-COVID. So, thank you very much. Uh, so in terms of general information, um, our passenger throughput pre-COVID was in the region of 20.3 million passengers per year. We had uh, 224,191 air traffic movements. We had 32,900 odd international flight departures. We had 42 airlines, 32 of which were international. And in terms of our runway capacity, we had 53 uh, hourly runway movements uh, per hour. Uh, our current capacity at our is 28 million passengers, so we still have a way to go before we achieve that. And in terms of our cargo movements, we were processing the region of 400,000 ton, 400, tons of cargo per month. So in terms of employees, uh, the airport generally employs in the region of 35,000 staff, of which 1,200 are AXA staff members based at OR Tamu International. Parking bays, we have 4,232 parking bays. And as you will well know, and everybody complains about the parking prices at OR Tambo, that was one of our major contributors to revenue at OR Tambo. Coming down to security, in terms of our capacity at peak, security can process in the region of 2,000 passengers per hour at domestic and 2,700 passengers international at capacity. And we have around 300, uh, we have 3,000 security personnel that's deployed uh, on a three shift basis. So there's about 1,000 security officers at any one time at the, at the airport. So these were pre COVID 19 conditions. And obviously, you can see these are substantial numbers. Um, those numbers um, have substantially dropped. And I'll take you through them as we go along. The next slide, please. Okay, you have impact on aviation. <laughs> Thank you very much. In terms of the impact on aviation, uh, you well know that you know the international borders shut down, and there were a massive reduction in in flight movements. There was an 80% reduction in international passenger movements. Um, and when I talk about international passenger movements, as we stand right now, we probably sit close on to 2,000 passengers internationally on a daily basis that are departing. 
this is a substantial drop from where we were. We were processing the region of 30,000 passengers, both international and domestic. The split was almost uh, almost evenly split. And right now we sit with, with only 2,000. Uh, luckily for domestic, we have a slight up uh, upswing in terms of the domestic numbers over the last month or two, and we are sitting in the region of about 9,000 right now. So that is substantially lower than what we were doing pre-COVID. Uh, and obviously now with the, with the current lockdown situations and the additional measures that have been imposed, those numbers have dropped slightly. Um, new health protocols, as you know, masks, social distancing, sanitizing, PCR tests are the, the order of the day at airports. So these things have to, be, have to be implemented and make sure that they are controlled effectively. The other challenges that we've had in terms of an impact was staff infections. We have a lot of staff that is in quarantine that goes across all departments, be it government or non-government departments, whether it's ramp, uh, ramp handlers, airlines. Um, staff are severely impacted in this particular environment due to the high contact rate that we have in place. Um, from a further impact, staff reductions across the entire aviation sector. Some, uh, some uh, estimates are between 10 and 90% reduction in staff throughout the various uh, stakeholders throughout the airport. And this has seen a substantial number of staff being retrenched um, and are currently sitting uh, without jobs. In terms of our GDP, uh, you will know that Gauteng um, in Africa uh, is measured at about 5% or just about 5% in terms of its contribution to Africa's GDP. And a lot of that GDP is generated through our Tambo International Airport. Increasing employment, that is, a, uh, that is something that has been plaguing our country for a while, but now with lockdown, I think with, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, this numbers have, have sharply increased, especially with the impact across all sectors where jobs are being reduced. Then people are currently facing um, uh, salary reductions. Um, there's a lot of companies that are currently reducing their salaries up to 50% of what they were paying staff previously just to retain staff. And, and that is, seems to be impacting on all environments. And then mothballing. I think, you know, we have never thought that we'd experience a situation where we would start to mothball infrastructure. Our Tambo, as an example, has mothballed uh, one international terminal because we just don't have the numbers to actually keep that particular infrastructure in place and obviously maintain the infrastructure at the cost that we currently, uh, that we used to previously maintain it at. Um, and depending on how revenue is generated, that will determine how various companies, not only our Tambo, but various airports, various companies, uh, determine exactly how much of the infrastructure they have available uh, to passengers or to people or to customers for, for that matter. Uh, next slide, please. Impact on security. Thank you. So in terms of the impact um, in security, I mean, security generally is um, you know, one of the easiest places that businesses will generally cut uh, to reduce costs. And due to the lower number of passengers, due to the number of areas that we've closed down in our environment, we have reduced security substantially. We have also started to renegotiate um, contracts as well as renew contracts, uh, non sorry, not renew contracts with security service providers due to the fact that we just do not have the requirements or alternatively, we just do not have enough funds to justify the cost of actually having those service providers on, on board. The next point is uh, security training and certification. Uh, in terms of regulated environments like your aviation industry, your various national key points and so forth, there are very specific requirements in terms of certification as well as training of staff. And with these uh, lockdown measures, this particular type of training and certification becomes a bit of a challenge due to the fact that you no longer are classroom based. You have a lot of work that has been done virtually and we were not ready. Uh, for quite some time uh, to handle the virtual impact of this particular aspect in terms of training and certification. Then also reduction in staff does not, uh, sometimes what you have is that you have infrastructure that needs to be guarded, but the moment you, you reduce the operation of certain areas, you will reduce staff and these create risk opportunities, uh, risks for, 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 for uh, criminality, um, damage to property, vandalism, um, and these are opportunistic issues that people then will take care, will, will take advantage of. PPE, security officers obviously love wearing PPE. So it is a constant 
battle to make sure that they understand the requirements of PPE, make sure they wear it, and make sure that they, they, they comply with the requirements that they would obviously have to enforce going forward. The scale of operations, a lot of operations have downscaled. Uh, you'll find that infrastructure is left unattended. You find that infrastructure breaks down. And when you find that infrastructure has been vandalized, so I'll give you a typical example. You have, um, you have various uh, IT server rooms that have been kept closed that are no longer guarded because they belong to a, a closed off infrastructure area and they can easily be vandalized, not only by, by, by general public, but also by, by actual people that are working within the airport precinct. So we have some of those issues that we have to face. So scaling down of operations is something that one has to really look at very carefully in terms of how it impacts general security of, of areas, as well as how you deploy your staff. And I think the last point is quite important. You know, from a security perspective, there sometimes is a lack of collaboration law enforcement agencies and security at various institutions. And I think this is an opportunity where we can really look at focusing our efforts at building these, um, these relationships with the law enforcement agencies to ensure they become a force, a force multiplier for us, they become a quick response in terms of assisting us when there are certain issues. I think many of you might have heard of the robbery that we had in cargo space in July. This was published. We had managed to bridge a lot of gaps with the EMPD or the traffic department as well as our SAPS colleagues. And the response when this armed robbery took place was such that we were able to then apprehend and unfortunately um, kill some of the suspects that, uh, that tried to rob one of our facilities. So collaboration with law enforcement agencies is absolutely integral to making sure that we are able to secure our facilities or secure our premises properly. Um, also, what's very important is that law enforcement agencies must become part and parcel of your integrated control rooms. So there should be an integrated approach in terms of how you approach security, uh, criminality, crime prevention, and so forth. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Changing the role of security. Okay, so in terms of the, the role of security change, uh, the, the way the, uh, security has changed its role, um, if you remember at one stage when we had the hard lockdown, we had a thing called repatriation flights where people that were uh, from other countries were, were wanting to return back to their countries of origin. And we as security took the lead together with operations. So basically the airport was run by two entities, security and operations. And you found that security had to multi-scale in many ways. Our whole baggage system was absolutely shut down and security screened baggage people by using canine and by using um, physical methods. So it's very important to understand that security plays an integral role. And the, and the, and the more you train your security officers to be multi-skilled in different aspects of an airport, as an example, or any business for that matter, they are able to then step in and take on functions to keep a business running without actually the core functions being there. The next point was uh, security and COVID-19 monitoring access control. You'll notice at airports now, you'll find that security officers are at all the entrances monitoring temperature. And, and this is becoming a norm, you know, to make sure that your temperature is taken by security officer, um, the person is checked for, or the passenger or, or, or customer is checked for PPE compliance, the person has a mask on, the person is sanitized, and so forth. And this is something that security officers never do. I must be honest with you, I was very uh, opposed to security officers dealing with issues like this. But when you're faced with a situation where businesses have downscaled to a point where you are basically surviving, um, one has to look at things very differently and make sure that the capacity of a security officer is a little bit more to be able to deal with these issues. Then I'd like to talk about touchless access. Um, you know, in high sensitive areas, in any, in any business, you will have areas that you, you, you need to have access. And biometrics, um, you know, touch biometrics are a thing of the past, I would believe. I doubt very much it's something that we're gonna ever subscribe to in the future, as long as we have these types of pandemics, uh, you know, prevalent in our society. Uh, one has to really look at alternatives to, to access control and how do we create a touchless environment to actually allow people to access areas uh, that are sensitive and that require certain levels of access. 
in terms of our technologies, we have smart security that we are currently using for our international passengers. And, and this particular aspect is to try and minimize the contact that a security officer has with the passenger or with the person in general. So typically the person must uh, remove all belongings as, as much as possible on their own um, and make sure that from the time that they enter a security checkpoint to the time that they leave a security point, a checkpoint, the necessity for a security officer to be in physical contact with the passenger is absolutely minimal uh, um, as far as possible. And, and this talks to also how we design uh, our standard operating procedures to talk to how we deal with uh, passengers or people or customers under COVID-19, um, uh, under this particular aspect of COVID-19. So I think one has to always look at your operating procedures, and this is key to making sure that we have a successful outcome when our security officers engage, uh, engage passengers or, or, or anyone for that matter. Awareness, I think awareness is very important. Awareness, security officers, I, I have in, in my entire career, have come across security officers that tend to forget after a while because job becomes mundane, uh, they become used to it, and eventually they do it automatically without actually thinking about the consequences of what they are doing or not doing. So making sure that they are aware of what they need to do on an ongoing basis by briefing, uh, constant briefings, but that's not only limited to security officers. That's, that's also extends to all staff in the business, as well as educating the customers that come to a business. So it's very important for us to make sure that there is that level of consistency throughout all environments when you deal with these particular issues. Then enforcement, I think every company has policies and procedures, and there is a level of enforcement. I know that in terms of our legislation, uh, the COVID-19 legislation, as well as regulations, make certain provisions for enforcement. And I think it's very important that when we take an approach of enforcement, it must be consistent and it must be applied uh, uniformly across the board. Security officers must be capacitated to understand the regulation and how they need to enforce it. So it's done professionally and it's done unemotionally. So I think that's a very important key aspect. And I think staff members also need to be uh, sensitized in terms of what the enforcement requirements are and that they understand the implications of not adhering to uh, the required legislation or policy or procedure in that regard. And the last point in terms of the changing role is command and control. And I think, you know, managers, the days of managers sitting behind desks and, and trying to manage an operation remotely um, have gone. One has to be on the floor with your team members monitoring lives. Uh, we, under, we undertook a recent, um, a recent role where all managers were required to be on the floor from 4 o'clock in the morning, as an example, until 2200 hours in the evening. And um, obviously, this was split into two shifts. But what we found was that being on the floor, monitoring performance, monitoring how our passengers were treated, monitoring how security was performing, as well as general staff, made a huge impact in terms of how security uh, became more professional over the time, understood their duties better, were free to ask questions. And when they seen us as managers step in to assist with a problem or explain certain things, it just made them feel so much more empowered. It also improved um, the general cleanliness of our place, how we managed to make sure that things that were left unattended were, were dealt with properly and so forth. So I think command and control is a key issue, uh, showing your people that you are there, making sure that you are visible, and making sure that you are supportive in your role as a manager, but also in their role as security officers. The next slide, please. Conclusion and discussion. Okay, thank you. In terms of conclusion, um, I think one of the key words that I just put some key words down, and I think it's just to, to highlight the areas that I think are very important that we need to take from this. And I think it's agility. Um, security officers, or security personnel, you know, have to be very agile. And the more you multi-scale these team members, the more you brief them, the more you, um, you invest in them as people, both from a training perspective as well as as a briefing perspective, they tend to be more capacitated, they tend to be more confident to deal with any type of situation that they, they face. And I think that's key to making sure that we are sustainable uh, in the near future. Cooperation, I think cooperation with all the agencies, coordination is also very important. I think those two go hand in hand. Uh, one has to make sure that we 
cooperate and coordinate with law enforcement, law enforcement agencies, but also the operations environment that we, we find ourselves very segregated from uh, in most environments. So I think that is key to make sure that we understand what they do, why they do it, how they do it, and how we as security, um, um, security personnel are able to support them better uh, and also ensure that we, we, we provide the outcome that we are looking for. Resourcing, I think resourcing is, is going to be key going forward. You know, with the downsizing in all businesses, how we resource our security officers becomes key in terms of understanding what the risks are and resourcing according to the risks. And, and, and understanding the risks means doing a proper analysis of one's business and making sure that the key areas of focus that touch customers but also touch the, the way a company operates um, is, is focused upon so that we don't waste unnecessary resources at doors that should be closed or can be closed and we have guards that are, that are posted at all of these areas. And I think training also is a, is a key issue. Ongoing training, this is the one area that we really must not stop investing in. I think when one has problems in any business, one of the areas that tends to go very quickly is your training. Um, and I think we must be very guarded in terms of how we, um, we, 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 how and what type of training we allow our people to go on. Uh, you know, in terms of airports, as an example, I'll give you a typical thing that we look at is behavioral training. Um, it's something that we must really invest in. Uh, people must understand exactly what to look out for, what are the signs um, that, that, that a security officer stationed at, a, at an entrance needs to look for when people are accessing that particular area. And I think the more we train them, the more we, we, we invest in them, uh, the better the outcome is going to be, the better the service is going to be, and I think the better the perception of any business is going to be. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Fantastic, Kamal. Thank you very much. I'm sure there's a lot of questions. I know I have a couple which I'd, I'd like to float into the forum. Um, before I throw out my hundreds of questions, is there anybody who has any specific questions for Kamal based on what he's got over? Is there nobody? All right. So, Kamal, um, from my side, uh, just a question specifically around a disaster, disaster management and, and crisis management preparedness. Where do you believe you as a national key point set specifically um, in how you handled the, let's call it the arrival or the, the flash arrival of a pandemic of this nature? Um, you know, if we look at the World Health Organization and over the past, I think it's roughly 10 to 12 years, there's been a pandemic set every two years. Uh, the stats are actually astronomical. So looking at uh, crisis management and emergency preparedness, where do you guys believe as you as a national key point set? And from a mobilization perspective, how quickly did you meet that? All right, thank you for the question. I think that's a very, very interesting and important question. So luckily for us as airports, we have um, um, various infrastructures are put into place. We have the Department of Health, uh, we have the SAPS, we have our own disaster management that attends uh, the Ikurulengi Disaster Management that attends our monthly LASP, which is the local airport security committee meetings, and one of the participants is disaster management. So whenever we face with a scenario where we could potentially find a, a, a situation where a, a virus could be accessing the, 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 the Republic, what we would then do is obviously ensure that we, we activate all these necessary participants uh, to, to help us or to assist us in terms of identifying, understanding what the protocols will be that we need to follow um, and ensure that we are capacitated to deal with this type of pandemic. We also have a business, a written business continuity plan that assists us in terms of a, a disease of this nature accessing the, the, the port, how we need to then treat it and how we need they need to deal with it. You know, in terms of cordoning off of areas, making sure that people are segregated, ensuring that people do not debark from, uh, disembark from an aircraft. Those are all written in. So I believe that we can respond quite quickly. However, I doubt very much that all other ports are capacitated the way we are. I hope that answers your question. It, it does, definitely. Now, the other thing I'd like to touch on is risks. Um, specifically, you, you mentioned that what you found is that your risks with obviously the, the reduction in deployments um, have increased. And something which came up quite recently was 
um, security companies are, are, are delivering great service over this area with their, let's call it retraining or redeployment and multi or upskilling of their um, the security officers' roles. However, the one thing we found recently is that um, the guys were deploying their staff, but the staff weren't being scanned for COVID. Um, did you guys find anything being in the on a national basis with the environment where security officers were upskilled, cross-skilled, etc., but weren't being scanned by the service providers themselves before they arrived on site? Um, what I can say is that or, uh, look, I'm not speaking for anybody, any other airport. I, I can only speak for my airport. Um, what I can say is that we scan everybody. Look, you must remember also, you know, that taking a temperature and making sure that you have a mask is no guarantee that you do not have COVID because, uh, you know, we've had cases where people that were asymptomatic did not display any form of increased or elevated temperatures um, that came to work. They, were, they went through a screening point, their temperature was taken, and they were tested positive. So we've had instances like that. I think more than anything else, having a screening point to ensure that the obvious is 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 uh, you know is highlighted is very important. I know our service providers are religious when it comes to making sure that you sanitize your hands before you access the airport. Um, you your temperature is taken at the various points, and um, that that um, you know you you are not entering an area with elevated temperatures, um, and and that is something that is 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 standard for us. Okay. Um, the other thing which you refer to, and going back to risks again, is you, you you talk about the impact on the aviation industry. Obviously, there's been a lot of, you talk about mothballing, mothballing of specific terminals, um, but you talk about increasing unemployment and salary reductions, and not only in the aviation industry, obviously, this is across the board within Southern Africa. Um, have you specifically found a direct impact on increased risks and shrink or losses within your environment? Uh, due to this? Look, um, so, so I, need to be, I need to be very cautious in terms of our answer to that question. But yes, um, you know, I think we, we've had certain losses where we were not able to deploy adequately enough security officers in a car park, as an example. And um, we've had thefts in the car park. We've had, um, we've had you know, windows broken, spare tires stolen. We've had the vandalism in some of our in some of our areas that are quite sensitive towards in terms of our IT infrastructure. Uh, so, so yes, we've had some of that because we've actually shrunk the number of staff that we've had. But what we found also in retrospect was that we were able to then utilize our control rooms and CCTV systems to to greater impact by having a coordinated approach. So, as an example. We've got the SAPS looking at cameras. We've got the EMPD looking at cameras. And we are able to then direct um, staff on the ground, which is minimal in comparison to what we had, to areas that we find people loitering or people that are, uh, that are looking, uh, that, are, that not necessarily belong there as a passenger or a staff member. So, so that's what I found an opportunity in. And although we have reduced numbers, we are now starting to use the resources that we had a lot more optimally than we previously did. So there's a lot of things that we can learn. You know, whenever you have, whenever you're faced with uh, these type of challenges, you know, there are so many opportunities that are born from them. Okay, fantastic. Um, well, you actually answered the next question was, well, with, with your increased use of the technology that are deployed, um, are you going to go back to the old ways of doing business, what's it, or are you going to continue to expand your investment and your SOPs with that environment? So I think I think you know um, every 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 uh, you know challenging situation changes the way we live, the way we react, the way we interact, and I think this is one has taught us many lessons, you know. And I think the lessons will obviously stay with us. I believe firmly that any company that has a very effective control room um, setup uh, and a coordination setup um, is able to manage. Uh, more effectively than having resources thrown at every problem. You know, I, I, I can honestly tell you, I need only two guards in every car park where there's 400 cars parked, as an example, whereas previously I had six of them, uh, six of the officers roving around, and I believe that currently 
two officers that we have there are employed a lot more effectively by directing them to problems uh, that we pick up from a visual basis in a control room. So, so yes, there's, a, there's going to be significant changes going forward, and I think the way we look at resourcing is going to change substantially. Uh, I also just want to highlight that, you know, as much as as much as um, we we have gone through this, and there have been severe challenges with us going through the past year, we have learned a lot of lessons in terms of how we can really optimize resourcing, but also optimize uh, the principles of job sharing. And, and, and duty arrangements and moving people around from one area to the other. I can tell you now, I, I, was, I was spoiled having an administrator in my office um, assisting me with my duties. I haven't had one for an entire year, basically. And it, it takes a little bit more organizing on my part, but definitely, you know, it, it, it shows that, you know, one, one administrator, as an example, can support three or four managers, whereas previously each manager had his own. So, so there's many things that we are going to look at in terms of how we do business and also the virtual reality that we currently face where everything is done virtually like you and I are currently speaking, you know, it's the new norm. There's no need to get onto a plane and fly to Kimberley to do an inspection. You know, one can do a complete inspection of the entire area, um, you know, visually um, while you're sitting in Johannesburg, as an example. So there are various things that we have learned from this. Um, the use of drones, as an example, I mean, that is something that's going to be uh, something that's going to look for the future. I mean, I have patrol vehicles that are going around my entire fence all the time. And when one thinks about two resources in a vehicle, um, you know, being used for this particular purpose, a single drone would probably be able to do that in 20 minutes and then be ready to do another patrol around. And so there's many ways that we can look at how we are going to change, techno change and use technology a lot more smartly in order to make sure that we are able to be effective in our current job. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much. So I've got a question from Franza Rickett. Um, what protocol have you put in place in the case of a positive um, COVID infection and how are security guards trained to treat this should they pick up an example of a person being infected? All right. So, so as an example, if a person is uh, comes into the airport and he has displayed a high, uh, a high um, temperature, the person is moved aside for a while because sometimes, you know, coming to an airport, or traveling in an airport tends to be, tends to be a huge challenge. You know, people get nervous. They they are, they are anxious when they get to an airport. They are running around, and eventually they get to the temperature check, and you find that person elevated we allow the person a few minutes to cool, to cool down and calm down if we do pick up that the person has a elevated temperature and it maintains we automatically alert port health a security officer then escorts that particular person to an isolation area and then that person is then handed over to port health uh, to take the matter further so that is typically one of the protocols that we would follow in this regard um, I, yeah, and I think I think that, that we've had in, instances at the airport where we have found people that have had a a positive COVID test while they were in the aircraft, as an example. You know, we had to recall the aircraft. We have managed to remove the person. Uh, we have sanitized. We have removed all the passengers, contained them in a particular area, sanitized the entire aircraft, given all the passenger particulars to the Department of Health to make sure that if anyone is, um, is tested positive subsequently, then we are able to then isolate and contain the people that were in the aircraft. So we've gone through these scenarios in actual, in, in, you know, in real life, and, and this is some of the ways that we've dealt with it as an example. So if we find a staff member or a person in a restaurant, the area is closed down, the restaurant is closed, the entire area is sanitized, staff members are put in quarantine, and obviously then tested subsequently and then allowed to come back to work once they have cleared the Okay, so the next question which has been asked was, if you looked at the, the technology being deployed prior to this, and then using like a facial recognition that measures temperatures, etc., cetera, um, have you deployed that technology within your environment and has it dropped down on your OPEX expenses on a month-to-month -month basis versus manpower? No, we have not deployed this particular type of technology. Currently, what we have is we have a two-way um, technology. One is obviously biometric, and the other is obviously a card scanning. Card scanning. So there has to be that dual verification. What we've currently done is done away with the biometrics, but we have we have uh, reduced the number of access points 
so that those access points are now manned and the cards are visually checked as well as um, you know, a person is asked to remove, uh, well, lower their mask to verify that the person is actually the person that is on the card. So obviously right now we are looking at ways and means of, of enhancing that particular process where it becomes a lot more seamless. So there's, there's technologies in terms of iris, there's technologies in terms of ratio and so forth. But these are very expensive technologies because they're not widely used. So it is areas that we need to look at. And also, one has to really look at the necessity for people to access certain areas. So, you know, as an example, do you require certain people to access certain basement areas? So, if it's not necessary, then you know, biometrics need to be, um, be need to be uh, placed in areas that have um, that have um, you know uh, prerequisites for a person to actually be in that particular area, and pre-defined rules in terms of your system to allow a certain person. So, as I, as a security manager, have a have a, a rule that allows me to access any area. Now that might not necessarily be the case for 90% of the people at the airport. So one has to really really look at the protocols that you have in place to understand how you deploy this technology. Um, noting the fact that it is extremely expensive, and, and 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 you know one cannot have something like this on one's balance sheet, where it's millions of rands being spent, um, you know, without having a proper understanding in terms of where it is properly required. Okay, and then if you had to look at um, the, the, the potential replacement of manpower, this is from Francois, uh, the, re the replacement of manpower um, in the passenger-based environment and utilizing, uh, for example, a facial recognition and or heat uh, scanning terminal to replace manpower in the airport. Have you guys looked at that um, or in any of the ports within South Africa um, to replace manpower? Obviously, it comes in at a third of the cost it pays itself off within 30 days. Look, I, you know, the thing is right now, you know, can, uh, most companies are bleeding. And I think uh, right now we, we're trying as much as possible to, to ease into the different aspects that we currently face. So, yes, it is something that is on the cards in terms of making sure that we are able to create a touchless environment. Look, other airports that are in, 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 in other countries that are countries where uh, they they tend to yield, you know, a lot more a lot more income, you know, per, per person in the country. Um, they have these technologies in place. I'm not going to name countries, but I think that we all know some of the countries that you can actually walk seamless through, seamlessly through an airport from end to end without actually encountering a person, with the exception of security. So there's a, there's various aspects that we need to look at. We're not quite there yet as a as a country. And it's something that we will obviously migrate to, but one has to take the various social and economic um, challenges that we currently have, um, you know, before we actually go to an environment or go to a, a situation where we uh, do away completely with, with staffing in certain areas. You know, we have uh, major union challenges in terms of uh, automation, and 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 these things are stuff that you have to really understand in terms of how to weigh them properly to make sure that you get the outcome that you desire. Fantastic. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if there's any further questions um, for Kamal um, on that. Kamal, it's, it's very, very much appreciated. Your input and uh, what you've given us, I think, is, is something to, to really take into consideration across the board. And I don't think it only applies to your facility. I think it applies to a number of the facilities on uh, a lot of people on this call um, across the board. Uh, where the approach that you guys have taken, and I can once again commend you guys. I've travelled a couple of times over both lockdowns, and it's it's been a seamless experience. And I think that's based on what you guys have pulled together from a cooperation and coordination perspective between yourself and the relevant departments. So once again, thank you very much. We really appreciate you dialing in and presenting.